Welcome explorers of the past to a journey into one of the world's most enigmatic mysteries, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Today, we're delving deep into its heart, into a hidden world that has baffled scholars and left us with more questions than answers. In this captivating YouTube video, we'll unravel the secrets of the well shaft, an enigmatic feature within the Great Pyramid. Its history, purpose, and the riddles it presents have fascinated experts and enthusiasts alike for centuries. Join us in this thrilling adventure as we unlock the mysteries concealed within this extraordinary structure. We'll share the latest insights from leading researchers and historians who have devoted their lives to understanding its significance. Get ready to be amazed as we uncover the astonishing story behind this ancient enigma. Are you prepared to open the doors to the unknown? But, be warned, what you're about to discover might change your perspective on history forever. Don't forget to hit that, subscribe, and ring the notification bell, and let us go. The Well Shaft The well shaft within the pyramid is a source of great confusion, and it's quite astonishing how the available information about it is both limited and contradictory. This situation serves as yet another example of the insufficient exploration that characterizes much of our understanding of the pyramid's interior. One of the earliest accounts of the well shaft comes from Benoit de Maillet, who is responsible for a section of the pyramid, as depicted above. In 1735, he published some of his observations, and this remains one of the most comprehensive accounts from the early explorers. There are mentions of the well shaft in even earlier records, such as Pliny's account, which mentions a well that is said to be 86 cubits deep, assuming Roman cubits, approximately 38 meters. However, such early data should be approached with caution due to its potential inaccuracies. Before Miley, Professor Greaves, during his travels from 1637 to 1640, provided a brief description of the well shaft that he could access. Greaves provided a somewhat peculiar description of the well. He said, at the end of the well, on the right-hand side, there is the well mentioned by Pliny. The well is circular, not square as described by Arabian writers. Its diameter exceeds three feet, and its sides are lined with white marble. Descending into the well is achieved by securing hands and feet in small open spaces cut into the inner walls, opposite and corresponding to each other in a vertical direction. Greaves provided this sketch of the well, which is quite intriguing because his description seems to refer to the initial vertical section of the well, closest to the Grand Gallery. It seems that he didn't descend into the well but rather conducted a sounding with a line to a depth of 20 feet. He also mentioned that he lit some combustible material and threw it down the well, discovering that it was blocked with debris. What's peculiar about Greaves' report is that the Arab accounts seem to be accurate in describing the upper vertical section as square, not circular. In fact, the Edgars, in their exploration, described this first vertical section as nearly 28 inches square and about 25 feet deep, which is clearly smaller than the 36-inch diameter mentioned by Greaves. One might wonder if Greaves used unreliable candles. However, a similar description appears to come from Miley, who states that the well is almost round or oval. The well shaft can be divided into four sections. Starting from the top, there's a vertical section approximately 25 feet deep, square in bore, and seemingly uniform in core masonry. After this initial vertical section, the shaft inclines to the south, where it becomes irregular in core masonry. This section is about 7.9 meters long. It then becomes vertical again for about 5.2 meters, and in this section, there's what's known as the grotto. The upper part of this section is lined with small masonry blocks, while the lower part is carved from the natural rock. Afterward, the shaft inclines again to the south, passing through the rock for around 26.5 meters, before deviating more steeply for the final 9.5 meters to connect to the descending passage. Its irregular path makes it challenging to measure, although the Edgars estimated the total length of the shaft to be about 200 feet, 61 meters, while Marajolio and Rinaldi approximate dimensions add up to 57 meters. 
In this illustration by Miraggio Leo and Rinaldi, emphasizing the somewhat irregular path of the shaft. There exists considerable debate regarding the construction and purpose of the shaft, but generally, it is believed to have served as an escape route for workers who released granite plugs to slide down into the ascending passage. Despite Greaves' account of the well shaft being obstructed with debris at approximately 20 feet, there seems to be no such obstruction during Miley's time. He mentions a square window that provided him access to the grotto, where he describes the void not as natural rock but as a type of gravel, strongly bonded together. Furthermore, he goes on to report that the shaft extended to a depth of 123 feet, 37.5 meters, where he encountered a blockage of sand and stones. It's unclear where this measurement originates, but if it was from the grotto, he must have been in the final steep section of the shaft. The significant point to take from Miley's description is that the grotto had already been accessed, and his mention of the grotto extending some 15 feet east-west suggests activity by searchers inside the grotto. It appears likely that the excavated material, along with the removed small masonry blocks, was simply thrown down the shaft, and this material might have been the obstruction that Miley encountered at the bottom of the shaft. The nature of the obstruction that Greaves observed remains uncertain. It could have been a block wedged in the shaft, which gathered debris around it. This is especially plausible as it seemed to be close to the point where the shaft turned southward. It doesn't necessarily imply that the entire shaft was blocked below this juncture. The shaft could have been clear below this point, much like Miley found it. As for when the grotto was first accessed, that remains a matter of speculation, but it could be quite ancient. The next notable individual to explore the well shaft was Nathaniel Davison, who lived in Cairo for approximately 18 months. In 1763, equipped with suitable attire and a lengthy rope, he ventured into the well shaft with the determination to reach its bottom. The details of these events were later published in 1817 by Robert Walpole, who included extracts from Davison's journals. Davison descended the first vertical shaft with a lantern lowered before him, attached to him by a cord. According to his account, this initial shaft was about 22 feet deep, 6.7 meters. From this point, his description becomes somewhat challenging to interpret. He mentioned, here he found, on the south side, at a distance of about 8 feet from the first shaft, a second opening which descended perpendicularly to a depth of 5 feet only, and at 4 feet 10 inches from the bottom of this, a third shaft, the mouth of which was nearly choked up with a large stone, leaving only a small opening, barely sufficient to allow a man to pass. It seems that he was describing the second section of the shaft leading to the grotto. In his account, he identified three components of the well shaft. The depth of the first shaft was 22 feet, of the second 29, and of the third 99. If the five feet between the first and second shaft be added, the whole depth will be found to be 155 feet. This description is challenging to reconcile with the data presented in Marigolio and Rinaldi's drawing. However, it's noteworthy that he mentioned the presence of a large stone in the shaft, which might be the same granite block now located inside the grotto. This block is believed to be a piece of a portcullis, and it is thought that Caviglia placed it inside the grotto. Similar to Miele, Davison also entered the grotto and described it as being approximately 15 feet in length, 4 or 5 feet wide, and about the height of a man. Neither Miele nor Davison reported the presence of a granite block inside the grotto, although their reports were relatively brief. Davison continued his descent along the longest section of the shaft, which was cut through the rock. Footholds carved into the corners of the shaft provided some grip, although some of these had eroded over time. As he progressed through this third section, he reported, at length, the shaft beginning to incline a little more to the perpendicular, brought him speedily to the bottom, where he ascertained it to be completely closed by sand and rubbish. This description likely corresponds to the same point where Miley's exploration was halted. From Davison's account, it seems that he had entered the final, lowest part of the shaft, which is steeper and leads to the opening of the descending passage. His description of the third section, which he estimated to be 99 feet, around 30 meters, aligns with this perspective. Marigolio and Rinaldi indicated that the start of the third section was approximately 26.5 meters long before becoming steeper for the last 9.5 meters. 
This suggests that Davison was standing on a pile of debris, approximately 6 meters from the bottom of the well shaft. Based on this illustration from the Edgar's Plate 11, I have indicated where Davison's exploration likely concluded. Davison mentioned that he discovered a rope ladder on top of a pile of debris. This ladder had apparently been left there by a Mr. Woods around 16 years earlier, who had abandoned his own expedition at the grotto. Additionally, Davison noted the presence of bats within the shaft, which raised concerns that they might extinguish his candle. Caviglia eventually succeeded in opening the well shaft in 1817. However, he didn't achieve this by removing the debris upon which Davison had stood, as doing so would have been a highly challenging task. Instead, he cleared the debris from the descending passage, which had been blocked for a long time below Mammon's Hole. During this operation, he noticed an opening in the west wall of the descending passage. By clearing the debris from this location, he finally managed to remove the obstruction that had once impeded Miley and Davison's progress. Regrettably, the well shaft remains one of the least explored areas within the pyramid. The available data, provided by different explorers, presents conflicting information, and the interpretations to explain the well shaft vary widely. It's evident that this area is restricted from tourists, leaving us with limited data, images, and videos to help us better understand it. As an example, if we compare the drawing by the Edgars here, we can observe that the second section from the bottom of the initial vertical shaft to the grotto appears highly irregular, contrasting with the depiction provided by Marigiolio and Rinaldi. This discrepancy raises questions about which is more accurate. From the accounts of the Edgars, it's apparent that they embarked on a journey down the well shaft and even placed iron pins for their ropes, meticulously measuring as they progressed. However, the impression we get from Marigiolio and Rinaldi's work is that they did not venture down the well shaft themselves but relied on the work of others. In the end, we are left with a collection of opinions and a scarcity of concrete data to definitively determine whose perspective holds more validity. Let's consider, for instance, the upper portion of the shaft, spanning from the Grand Gallery to the Grotto, which traverses the core masonry of the pyramid. In this context, there are two conflicting viewpoints. One view posits that the shaft was carved through pre-existing core masonry, while the other contends that the shaft was constructed concurrently with the laying of the masonry. Dormion's perspective suggests that initially, the well shaft only extended as far as the grotto. The evidence found in the rock cuttings indicates that the shaft was chiseled downward to connect with the descending passage. This passage would have served as a means to remove excavated material from the subterranean chamber. The reason for the steeper angle at the end of the shaft is that its original trajectory was meant to align with the end of the descending passage. However, due to a discrepancy in the timing of the shaft's excavation compared to that of the descending passage, the shaft was shortened. The decision to abandon the subterranean chamber rendered the well shaft unnecessary. It would have been sealed off at the grotto, and the pyramid's masonry would have continued rising above it. However, a subsequent alteration in the closing mechanism for the ascending passage, as suggested by Dormion, which was initially planned to have three sliding portcullises but was changed to plug stones, necessitated an escape route for the workers. Consequently, the upper section of the well shaft was carved through the already constructed core masonry to connect with the lower, rock-cut portion of the shaft. This perspective on the events might seem reasonable, but as discussed in part one of this video, Lenner and Hawass propose evidence suggesting that the subterranean chamber was actually the last part of the pyramid to be constructed. If this interpretation holds true, then what purpose could the well shaft have served? The idea that the closing mechanism for the ascending passage was altered is also questionable, as I previously mentioned in part 1. It appears that the lower end of the ascending passage was intentionally designed and shaped to accommodate the initial granite plug stone. This implies that from the very beginning of constructing the ascending passage, a decision had been made to seal it with plug stones. Regarding the location of the girdles where Dormion suggests portcullises were initially planned, this appears illogical, as these girdles are farther up the passage. If we accept Dormion's concept that these three girdles were originally intended to hold sliding portcullises similar to those found in the Bent Pyramid, it would imply that these portcullises were constructed first. He states, for some reason that escapes us, this downstream blocking system, i.e., the three sliding portcullises, 
was abandoned in favor of the upstream system of plugstones. Understanding Dormion's rationale regarding these portcullises can be challenging because he appears to suggest that the uppermost portcullis was the last to be completed. If that were the case, wouldn't it imply that the ascending passage was constructed from the bottom up? To me, this seems to be the most logical construction sequence for the passage. The junction of the ascending, descending passage is in close proximity to the natural rock, and I can envision the builders taking advantage of this as they started laying the massive blocks at the lower end. These blocks were intentionally cut through to narrow the passage, likely to control the movement of the granite plug stones. If Dormion is proposing that portcullises were the initial sealing solution before the switch to plug stones, then the narrow end of the ascending passage shouldn't exist before the introduction of the portcullises. It's easier to remove material, but adding material is a more complex task. Therefore, if portcullises were the intended solution, we should expect the lower end of the ascending passage to have its standard 2 cubit width, without any narrowing. Changing the design to plug stones would require adding material to create the narrowing at this end. However, there's no practical way to add material to rock that has already been cut. This would necessitate a complete dismantling of all the masonry in the junction area and introducing new masonry. Given the higher elevation of the portcullises and the ongoing construction of the masonry portion of the descending passage, this would seem like an impossible task. But what about the portcullises themselves? Considering that each portcullis housing would be higher as you progress up the passage, shouldn't we expect that some had been completed with the portcullis in the retracted position and the housing ceiling finished? If this were the case, it would imply that some dismantling was involved as part of the housing and portcullis had to be removed, and the resulting empty slots filled with what we now call girdle stones. Some of these issues could potentially be addressed by suggesting that the ascending passage was constructed from the top down. However, this approach seems illogical to me. The more straightforward solution might be that the locations originally thought to be for portcullises were always intended for girdle stones. The function of these girdle stones is aptly described by Marajolio and Rinaldi. In Corridor, A, it is clear that there could have been a strong downward thrust, and the girdle stones served to distribute the pressure of the blocks forming the upper part of the corridor onto those in the lower part. Essentially, the girdle stones prevented the pavement, sides, and ceiling from forming uninterrupted sliding surfaces in the masonry. They served to connect the inclined layers of the corridor with the horizontal ones in the rest of the core masonry. All the blocks in the northern part of corridor, A, are girdle stones, which is logical as the maximum thrust was concentrated here. As you move upwards, the girdle stones become more spaced out and eventually disappear at the south end where there was the least thrust and, in any case, opposition from the girdle stones lower down. This interpretation suggests that the features initially thought to be for portcullises were actually an integral part of the structure, designed to handle the pressure and maintain the stability of the passage. As discussed in Part 1, the available data concerning the ascending passage is quite limited. Based on the existing information, it's challenging to definitively determine whether the portcullises proposed by Dormion were ever part of the architect's original plan. That being said, the concept of a portcullis system does seem like an ideal solution, as it would have allowed the funerary procession relatively unobstructed access to the king's chamber, without the need to navigate around plug stones stored in the Grand Gallery. This leads to the question of whether the Grand Gallery, in its colossal form, was even necessary. If there were no plug stones to store, the ascending passage could have maintained its width all the way to the king's chamber without such extensive construction. Furthermore, the well shaft might not have been required in this scenario, as workers could have safely retreated from the pyramid by lowering each portcullis from inside the ascending passage. The idea of a portcullis system appears straightforward and efficient, which raises the question of why it was abandoned in favor of a system that involved the well shaft and the significant construction efforts in creating the Grand Gallery. One possibility is that the portcullis system was never part of the architect's original plan, and we may be projecting this idea onto features that may have had a different function, as described by Marajolio and Rinaldi. Even if we were to consider the possibility that the subterranean chamber was constructed first, it raises the question of whether there was a genuine need for the well shaft as a means to remove cuttings. 
This doesn't appear to be a very practical or user-friendly route, especially when there was a larger descending passage available. One might suggest that it was built for ventilation purposes, but this raises doubts considering the extensive network of tunnels and structures created under the Step Pyramid and other pyramid complexes, where such ventilation features were notably absent. In simpler terms, the well shaft's function as a ventilation or cuttings removal system seems questionable, especially when more straightforward alternatives were available. The most debated aspect of the well shaft is the section that traverses the core masonry of the pyramid. Different experts hold contrasting views on this matter. For instance, Dormian asserts, likewise, the entire upper part of the shaft connecting the north landing of the Grand Gallery to the grotto was excavated through pre-existing masonry. There is widespread consensus on this point, which is beyond dispute. However, Marijolio and Rinaldi offer a different perspective, stating, the space for the upper portion of this shaft was incorporated into the pyramid's masonry during its construction. It descends vertically for a considerable distance through the nucleus masonry. At a certain point, it becomes irregular, bending to the south, with the resulting inclined part carved out of the nucleus masonry. Subsequently, it penetrates the rocky core of the pyramid above the level of the foundation pavement, leading into what is referred to as the grotto. Marijolio and Rinaldi seem to hold the view that the initial vertical section of the shaft was constructed concurrently with the masonry, while the irregular inclined part had the appearance of being cut through pre-existing masonry. Although there are only two low-quality images of this initial vertical section, they suggest that the shaft is relatively uniform and neatly built. Sir William Flinders Petrie provided his opinion on this matter, stating, the plan of the passages was certainly altered once, and perhaps oftener, during the course of the building. The shaft, or, well, leading from the north end of the gallery down to the subterranean parts, was either not contemplated at first, or else was forgotten in the course of building. The proof of this is that it has been cut through the masonry after the courses were completed. On examining the shaft, it is found to be irregularly tortuous through the masonry, and without any arrangement of the blocks to suit it. While in more than one place a corner of a block may be seen left in the irregular curved side of the shaft, all the rest of the block having disappeared in cutting the shaft. This is a conclusive point, since it would never have been so built at first. The Edgars offered a counterpoint to Petrie's reasoning, stating, Our comment upon this reasoning is that, because a section of the tortuous part of the shaft may have been cut through while some of the masonry blocks were in situ, this is not at all a conclusive proof that the well was not in the original design. For the same thing is evident in the bore of the first ascending passage, especially at the lower end of that passage, as we have already noticed, and Professor Petrie does not suggest that the first ascending passage was a mere afterthought. And then it is in the tortuous part only that such cutting seems to have been made, for Professor Petrie says nothing of the long section of the shaft which is not tortuous, that is, the top, vertical part, which is square and bore, and presents every appearance of having been built. So, who is correct in this debate? Unfortunately, much like many aspects of pyramid research, the available data is severely lacking. There are no detailed plans of the masonry layout, no images, or comprehensive documentation to provide a definitive answer. This is a common issue in pyramid exploration, where we often encounter opinions without the necessary data to independently verify their accuracy. As for the question of whether the shaft was cut through pre-existing masonry, one might wonder why this question persists into 2023. Ideally, a meticulous forensic examination of the shaft should be able to resolve this matter conclusively. However, regrettably, I suspect that this question will continue to be raised in the coming centuries. One aspect to consider is the potential damage to the irregular part of the shaft caused by the removal of masonry. For example, an item from Caviglia's list of measurements mentions a block of granite that had fallen into the well, which was measured to be at a depth of 38 feet. This block was likely inside the tortuous part of the shaft and might be the same granite block now found in the grotto. The degree of irregularity in this part of the shaft is not precisely known as specific data on its condition is scarce. The Edgars describe this section of the shaft as very uneven, lacking a uniform square or round section. It appears as though stones might have been dislodged from its walls, resulting in this irregularity. 
The irregular section descends through the rough core masonry of the pyramid, with visible open joints between the core stones. Some early accounts of the Great Pyramid mention that this section of the shaft was once cluttered with large stones, suggesting that these had to be removed or repositioned, potentially requiring some alteration to the shaft itself. One account from Colonel Howard Weiss references M. Caviglia's descent of the well in 1817, where he encountered a passage inclined towards the south that was nearly blocked by large stones. Removing these stones was quite challenging due to the confined space. This information suggests that the condition of the shaft may have been affected by activities like stone removal, and the irregularity in this part of the well may be a result of such interventions. The shaft would eventually lead to the second vertical section which goes through the grotto. This drawing, provided by the Edgars, represents a cross-section of the grotto and a segment of the second vertical section. According to their observations, the shaft passing through the grotto was lined with ten layers of small masonry blocks. As for the grotto itself, it seems to be a naturally occurring cavity filled with densely packed material. This drawing also provided by the Edgars depicts an overhead view of the grotto, showcasing the presence of a substantial granite block. It seems unlikely that an object of this size could have fallen accidentally into the well shaft. It raises the possibility that it might have been intentionally positioned in the shaft by local guides to deter tourists from further exploration similar to how they block the descending passage. In this image, we see the grotto. In the bottom left corner, we catch a glimpse of the granite block. We are looking at the bottom courses of the small masonry, sitting on the natural rock. The solitary masonry block at the top of the image is outlined in Edgar's drawing on the previous page. Also, please note the rope on the right side of the image. The Edgar's reported, it is longer from east to west than from north to south. The roof is so low, and except in one spot to the west, where there is a deep hollow in the floor, it is too low to allow one to stand. The floor, walls, and roof are composed for the most part of gravel embedded in caked sand, which crumbles when touched. Here and there, the natural rock appears. Dormion reported that these small masonry blocks were tightly placed against the compacted fill of the grotto. Excessive gypsum was discovered on the back of these blocks, with particles of the fill adhering to the gypsum. While some have suggested that the small masonry shaft was constructed first and then backfilled with this material, the prevailing consensus is that the fill is a natural conglomerate of materials. The drawing by the Edgars shows core masonry above this fill, although this area remains largely unexplored. The exact time when the breach into the grotto was made remains unknown, but it likely drew the attention of early explorers. Beneath the grotto, we enter the beginning of the longest section of the well shaft, which is entirely carved out of the natural rock. This was likely a task for the laborers who had no other choice, as it must have been a challenging and unenviable job. According to the Edgar's description, in this inclined part of the shaft, the average height between the roof and the floor is approximately 30 inches. The width at the roof is greater than at the floor, with the former being about 25 inches and the latter about 22 inches. Unlike the descending passage and the small horizontal passage that leads to the pit, this section of the shaft is not as precisely cut into the rock. Instead, there are rough areas of the rock left in the corners between the two walls and the floor. These rough portions of rock serve as footholds and are evenly spaced throughout the shaft. However, these footholds are not particularly large and might not feel secure to those who are not accustomed to such environments. In this part as well, the Edgars noticed an unusual feature. However, it was noted that about the middle of its length, there is a slight westward bend and then a return eastward to the same general line. In this image, which is Edgars Plate 22, an arrow points to the bend in the shaft as reported by the Edgars. However, based on their drawing, it raises questions about whether there might have been another bend in the masonry section of the shaft. Despite its considerable length, the shaft maintains remarkable accuracy and alignment with the main passage system. Here we can see a bend or curvature in the well shaft, possibly designed to slow down any falling objects or individuals. This feature might have been intended to serve as a safety measure, preventing accidents in the shaft. The final part of the well shaft changes direction, becoming nearly vertical as it connects to the descending passage. This change in direction might have been made for specific reasons, such as creating a shortcut to the descending passage. When looking at a side elevation of the pyramid, 
it appears that the initial inclined section of this part could have continued directly to connect with the end of the descending passage. However, for unknown reasons, the final part of the shaft takes a different course and becomes more vertical as it meets the descending passage. Currently, the well shaft is sealed and remains unexplored, and there is limited data available about its construction and purpose. Today its need for modern exploration techniques like 3D scanning and a thorough examination of the masonry along the shaft's path to gain a better understanding of its construction and function. Today, the entrance to the well shaft from the Grand Gallery is no longer accessible, but the Edgar brothers managed to capture some images of it. The ramp in this location has suffered significant damage, and it is commonly believed that the destruction of a covering stone that concealed the entrance to the well shaft was a major factor in the damage to the ramp, which is adjacent to the north wall of the Grand Gallery. However, upon close examination of the area, it appears unlikely that such a covering stone ever existed. Much like the prismatic stone believed to have concealed the ascending passage, the idea of a covering stone may be a product of our imagination rather than historical evidence. In this image from Marijolio and Rinaldi's TAV5 that shows the entrance to the well opening in the pyramid. In this image, there is a small amount of masonry left between the first ramp hole and the well shaft's opening. However, based on the dimensions provided by Piazzi Smith and Petrie, the described reconstruction of this area seems unlikely. The actual size and configuration may not align with the depicted reconstruction. The horizontal distance between the well opening and the north wall of the gallery is approximately 21.3 inches, according to Piazzi Smith. Petrie's measurement is 21.8 inches. Assuming that the ramp's intended angle is 1 to 2, the inclined length to the well opening would be approximately 23.8 inches. The starting hole on the east ramp is relatively long, measuring about 23 inches, as we mentioned in part 1. If a similar long hole were present on the west ramp, it would occupy most of the distance to the well shaft opening, as shown in the reconstruction image above. Some researchers have suggested the existence of a red covering stone that would create the south wall of the ramp hole. However, did such a covering stone actually existed? Here, we can see a cross section from east to west through the well shaft opening, and I have highlighted the position of a possible covering stone. Dimensions for this area differ significantly among many sources. Piazzi Smith would give the length of the short horizontal passage from the east side of the hole in the floor to the west side of the well shaft as 84.5 inches, 2.15 meters. Marigiolio and Rinaldi gives 2.11 meters. Smith would give the depth of the hole from the horizontal passage as 27 inches, with the width of the passage being around 28 inches. The Edgar's report mentions significant damage to the floor of the horizontal passage. However, they also note that a small part of a step at the passage's entrance appears to have survived. This surviving portion of the step is represented by the dotted line, which is believed to mark the original floor level of the passage. The available dimensions indicate that only one worker could comfortably fit in this narrow passage. This has implications for the use of a covering stone. Marigiolio and Rinaldi calculated that any covering stone would have weighed approximately 1350 kg. Given the limited space and the stone's substantial weight and shape, it's unclear how such a stone could be installed, especially with the 16 cm undercut shown in this image. It raises questions about the necessity of having a covering stone in the first place. The common consensus is that the well shaft served as an escape route for workers after removing the plug stones. As they left the Grand Gallery for the last time, they would lower a covering stone over the opening. However, this idea appears somewhat illogical because it wouldn't provide a significant barrier to potential tomb robbers. If robbers discovered the well shaft at the bottom of the descending passage, they could simply climb up the shaft and break the covering stone from the inside. This process is believed to have caused significant damage to the ramp north of the well entrance, as shown in the Edgar images here. The red lines in the left image outline the ascending passage as it connects with the Grand Gallery, while the right image, taken from a different angle, has a red line marking the top of the east ramp. An alternative explanation for the damage to the ramp and the surrounding area could be that the ramp hole, being a long hole with no southern end, was impacted by a glancing blow from a piece of granite portcullis that was thrown down the gallery. In this scenario, there might not have been a need for a covering stone. 
While the builders may have attempted to disguise the entrance to the descending passage, the primary security measure would have been to seal the upper part of the descending passage, making it difficult for intruders to access the inner chambers. If we were to assume the existence of a covering stone for this well shaft opening, the question arises, where could it have been stored before being used to seal the entrance? Several practical issues complicate the idea of a large and heavy covering stone. Storage location. If the stone was to be stored within the passage, its depth, including the undercut, would obstruct the space between the ramps. This would impede the movement of plugging stones. Platform removal. Another potential storage location could be under the bridging platform, but this would require the platform to be removed before fitting the covering stone. The logistics of removing and replacing the platform for sealing the passage seem impractical. Size and weight. The size and weight of a large covering stone would pose challenges in a confined space like the passage. It's unclear how such a massive stone could be effectively positioned and sealed in this location. Given these practical challenges, it seems more plausible that the opening was sealed with a series of smaller, manageable blocks or stones, similar to the lining seen in the shaft through the grotto. These smaller stones could have been hoisted up the well shaft and used to close the passage effectively. One intriguing aspect of the well shaft that is often overlooked in discussions is the marked area highlighted by an arrow in Pering's drawings. The Edgar brothers, who extensively explored the Great Pyramid, made note of this feature. At the upper end of the vertical shaft, on its north side, there is a rather significant excavation. The rough floor of this excavation is where our team placed the iron pin used to suspend the ladder. The purpose behind this excavation remains unknown. It is speculated that the excavators might have created this opening to enhance headroom for their work or possibly for another purpose. Like much of the well shaft and the pyramid in general, detailed data about this feature and the stone layout along this short passage is either non-existent or unpublished. However, if Pering's drawings are accurate, it represents a significant space. If it dates back to the pyramid's construction, it could have been used to store small stone blocks for sealing the short passage. While the prevailing consensus regarding the well shaft is that it served as an escape route for workers, an alternative perspective is presented by Marajolio and Rinaldi. They suggest that the well shaft was filled and sealed with a large covering stone after the abandonment of the subterranean chamber. According to Marajolio and Rinaldi, the plug stones in the Grand Gallery were operated similarly to those found in the satellite pyramid next to the bent pyramid, rendering the well shaft unnecessary. The example of the satellite pyramid is somewhat relevant, although it had a steeper gallery inclined at about 34 degrees, and the construction didn't proceed entirely as planned. In the satellite pyramid, a different configuration was observed. The plug stones in this pyramid were positioned in a gallery that had the same width as the ascending passage, and the ceiling of the gallery was elevated to provide access to the chamber. Instead of a service shaft, this pyramid appeared to use a trigger mechanism to release the lead plug stone and a chain of other plug stones into the ascending passage. As of today, two of the upper plug stones are still present in the gallery, as they failed to slide down into the ascending passage. It remains uncertain whether the builders were aware of this failure or not. There's no guarantee that the trigger for the lead plug stone even set it in motion. In such a situation, it's possible that someone had to climb up the passage and attempt to initiate the movement of the lead plug, quickly retreating as the plug began to descend. Marijolio and Rinaldi would suspect a somewhat similar mechanism in the Great Pyramid, and therefore doing without the need of the well shaft. However, it is difficult to see how such a solution could work in the Great Pyramid, given the much greater length of the Grand Gallery and Ascending Passage, and the sheer number of plug stones required if it was the intention to largely fill the ascending passage with them. These plug stones may have rested on the floors of their respective galleries for years, during which time, dust and small debris could settle amongst them, and maybe a buildup of such material led to the failure at the satellite pyramid. So, for an operation of this size, I should imagine that workers would be a requirement inside the Grand Gallery, to ensure a positive outcome. Especially given the shallower angle of about 26 degrees, where I should imagine that each block was released individually, and possibly with the aid of some lubricant. The well shaft within the Great Pyramid remains a puzzling and enigmatic feature, even in the modern age.
Our knowledge about it is primarily derived from the often contradictory viewpoints of different researchers, and detailed, concrete information about the shaft is sparse. As it currently stands, we lack the necessary data to definitively understand how it was constructed and what its precise purpose was. Consequently, we can only offer speculative interpretations regarding its intended role. My best interpretation is that the well shaft had a dual purpose. Firstly, it played a significant role in aligning and orienting the passage system within the pyramid. Secondly, it served as a service shack designed to help seal the ascending passage using the plug stone stored in the Grand Gallery. I agree with Lenner and Hawass's perspective that the subterranean chamber was among the last constructions inside the pyramid, and we can exclude it from our consideration when discussing the well shaft's role. It wouldn't make sense to create a well shaft for a chamber that was not originally planned. If we accept the theory that the descending passage was initially designed as a dead end, as discussed in a previous section, we must question why the well shaft was constructed. As others have pointed out, the remarkable accuracy of the descending passage's alignment with the pyramid's azimuth suggests it might have been precisely oriented to something in the night sky to maintain this alignment. However, the alignment of the ascending passage and the grand gallery, pointing southward, presents a challenge. How were these elements aligned with the correct azimuth? Many astronomers and researchers have proposed various theories on how the passages within the Great Pyramid might have been aligned astronomically. Recently, David Lightbody has shed light on the concept of trial passages and how they could have played a role in pyramid alignment. It's a complex and debated topic. However, it's interesting to consider the possibility that the well shaft, particularly with its two vertical sections, could have been used by zenith observers. These observers could have communicated their observations to individuals tasked with polar observations. The well shaft's exit point near the end of the descending passage could have facilitated this communication. It's worth noting that verbal communication through the well shaft seems feasible, as the Edgars reported an incident where they heard a voice coming up from the well shaft, located 125 feet below, asking them if they were coming down for tea. This anecdote highlights the potential for acoustic communication within the pyramid. The initial vertical shaft through the grotto may have been used for zenith observations. It's interesting to note the vertical shaft in the so-called trial passages closely matches that of the well shaft in being about 28 inches square. Though the initial start point for the shaft on the desert surface may have been a best approximation to the architect's unified plan for the pyramid, and where he expected the shaft to enter the grand gallery. One can imagine that it was a difficult calculation for its location and how it would connect to the optimal spot chosen for it in the Grand Gallery. This spot in the Grand Gallery could only be nailed down as the ascending passage was getting closer to the Grand Gallery location, and confident of their location. The upper vertical part of the shaft may have been left in the core masonry, whilst the core masonry below was cut through to connect to the initial shaft through the grotto or the core masonry was gradually staggered across to its new vertical location, and later damage caused by extracting masonry, hence creating the irregular section. Today, we've delved deeper into the mysteries of the Great Pyramid's well shaft. We hope you enjoyed our journey and learned more about this ancient enigma. If this is your first time visiting our History of Ancient Egypt channel, don't hesitate to subscribe and hit the notification bell to receive all the fantastic videos we have in store. Thank you all for watching and joining us on this amazing adventure. We look forward to seeing you in our upcoming videos. Until next time, in new adventures and thrilling mysteries. Stay safe.